We have been in the life of Jesus now for a little over a year and a half. And we've been doing it in different segments. Just recently, as of last week, we have started a section just on the parables of Jesus, looking about how to study those, how to pull out of those into our lives and what Jesus uh, used them for, basically to give us these incomprehensible thought processes of the kingdom of God and how God thinks and what he calls us to that are very foreign to us by putting it side by side with things that we're familiar with. And so uh, last week we started out this study and we'll experiment a little bit with a study tool on the characteristics of a parable. And we'll put those up on the screen for you, Chris, if you would, and then we're going to just leave those up for a little while. Um, this is something that generally you find in the parables, and we use it as a tool so we can study parables at home as well to go a little bit deeper than maybe just a casual reading. In the parable, you always have the familiar, what we're used to, what kind of sets the tone. Then there's always something added in that's unfamiliar, and then Jesus goes back into the familiar and says, okay, let's see how familiar has changed. Now we see from God's perspective, what changes do we have there? Uh, and then there's usually an unexpected, component to it, and then there's also a question to ponder, whether it's something that he asked directly, or whether it's something that's kind of left there for you to, to consider, or the original audience to consider. And again, as I shared last week, I don't know if this matches every parable. This is something I came across a couple weeks ago. I have not experimented through all the parables uh, on how it's going to happen, but we, we are putting it out there to see if it does. And, and we're using it as a tool to see where it falls short and where it takes and comes into fullness. Uh, I will say today, as we go through uh, some parables on poverty and wealth, last week we talked about humility versus pride. Uh, as we talk about wealth and, and poverty, there's going to be kind of three parables, kind of three parables in a couple of different ways. Uh, and in the first two parables, this does apply, and then it doesn't in the third, but I think there's a very good reason for it. And uh, we'll get into that as we go. Does it sound good? Okay, let's go to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12 is where we're going to head into and look at this particular area of things. Um, and as, as we get now, I'll just talk about a couple of things. With the, with the three parables that we have, uh, on wealth and, and poverty. It's going to be interesting, or at least it was interesting to me, all three of these start out with there was a rich man. Uh, no matter what audience he was talking to, there's three different audiences he talks to uh, that are very different when it comes to health and, and, uh, and uh, not health, but uh, poverty and wealth. And then um, he always starts out with the rich man. And I think it's because there's something within most of us that wants to be the rich man. And so the rich man is oftentimes put out there when we're talking about financial, uh, how we sell finances and our financial faithfulness. So um, in the first one, we're going to see that he's talking to a crowd of people that are in poverty for the most part. He's talking to a crowd of people. So uh, let me read some of this again. If you don't have a Bible, there's Bibles and baskets underneath the chairs around the room. And your version is up and running if you want to use your, your tablet or your phone. But uh, starting at verse 13, it says, Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But Jesus said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And Jesus said to them, Take care and be on guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentiful. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For now for I have nowhere to store all of my crops. And he said, I'll do this. I'll tear down my bones and build larger ones, and then I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you and the things that you have prepared. Whose will they be? So it is to the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Okay, so if we go back to that, that system of things there, the familiar is going to be uh, in the crowd. Again, a mix of people. Um, again, the reason I say poverty for the most part is crowds are usually poverty crowds. If you think back like, okay, I saw this show on Jesus' life, or I watched The Chosen, or I saw this on the Summit of the Mount, uh, you generally are thinking of either people that are poor and don't have much, people are struggling, or people that are rich, 
that have quite a bit going for whether it be a religious leader who's gotten rich from the, from their standpoints of Rome or the tax collectors. Those are the two you think of. And that's actually a good thing because in the context of Jesus' day, that's the two classes. Middle class really wasn't a thing in Jesus' day. You either were struggling or you had plenty. And so if he's got a crowd of more common people, most of the people in that crowd are not going to have finances. And in this particular case, we have a gentleman who is upset about how his brother's handling his inheritance. Again, when you're looking back at that time, uh, if I died, um, my, half of my property goes to my oldest son. And then everything else kind of goes back to the quarters. And you think, well, what about Jenny? Well, back then, Jenny was kind of more property, and the oldest son was also in charge of taking care of her. But she wouldn't get the property. So in this case, somewhere along the line, a, a father has died, and the brother is not giving this brother what he feels he deserves, which could be possibly, I don't think it's the most likely of answers, that it's been divided up to the point that there's really nothing left to divide up. I mean, if you start out in a generation, you have one acre, and you divide down to half acre and a bunch of quarters to a quarter acre to a bunch of eighths, and to, sooner or later there's not really anything to be there, but that doesn't necessarily mean that people are going to stop having struggles when it comes to figuring out wills. Uh, the more likely answer is the brother's being stingy and not following the law, and that he is coming to this wilderness wandering leader, religious leader to get, to get help. Um, unfortunately, this is not something that's just Jesus' day. Uh, when I worked in nursing homes, uh, I was teaching nursing homes for about eight years before COVID hit, um, kind of took that ministry away for a while. I can't tell you, one, how many people were lonely in the nursing homes that have been pretty much abandoned by their families. And then when they passed away, how many of those families split because they were all fighting over what mom or dad had. Um, and it, sadly, it's not just in nursing homes. In the church ministry, it's far too often families split when a, when a loved one passes away and adds to the hurt and the challenge of, of this. And Jesus speaks into it pretty, pretty boldly because that shouldn't happen. It really shouldn't happen. I, I, maybe you've got some kind of unique situation that you've been through or that you go through in the future. Uh, I can't imagine what that is. Basically, do not destroy your family over $10,000, $5,000, over some house. That stuff goes so fast and your family's gone. It's, it's sad. And so when Jesus is addressed with this, he says, man, who, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? Now, somewhere, you know, one of the disciples like, get Jesus's coffee. Because he came off kind of strong, I think. He came off kind of, kind of harsh, man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? But I think in reality, he's just being blunt about something that we need to be blunt about because we fall into it so, so hard. Everything after that, that he says, is very straightforward. Take care. Don't, don't fall into like this, this trap of things. Be on your guard against covenants. Um, life is not about possessions. He, he, he's hitting it hard because the guy has a hard struggle. The exact same struggle that you and I easily have. It's just how we do when it comes to, comes to finances and happens too often. So that's kind of getting into it. And so let's go through from this particular standpoint. The familiar when it gets to the, the parable in this context is about the rich man. And this is, again, something very familiar to them. He's, he's successful. Uh, he has to build new bones. And that was, that was very familiar at that time, too. If you had a farm... The last thing you want to do is build more bonds because that ate up more land, which means less returns in the future. So the common practice of the day is if you did well, you would tear down the old bonds and build new bonds because even though it took more land, it's not as much. You could be more efficient, those type of things. So they're very familiar with the, the, this practice. Uh, he has ample goods. His attitude is relax, eat, drink, and be merry. If you notice, he's not being set up as a bad guy. It's not like he, he, he's saying this guy's so evil because he, he did well. He's being set up as what they want to be. He's talking to a group of people that struggle financially. And man, to get to the point that I can just eat, drink, be merry, not worry about this stuff, that sounds good uh, from a familiar standpoint. And then he throws in the unexpected. Guys, the guy's a fool. The guy's a fool. And then all of a sudden you're like, wait a minute, how's he a fool? I said, I thought he was doing pretty good. And then he had to go back and say, what did he do that was foolish? What was the thing that was, was throwing him off? The other, other thing when we're getting into the unexpected is not only is he being called a fool, he's being called a fool by God, and God is speaking to him directly. If they don't get that Jesus is God, God has not spoken to anyone in 450 years. 
and God thought it was so important to call this guy an idiot? It's not quite what he's calling him. If you go to Psalms, fool with someone who doesn't, have, doesn't believe in God and doesn't have the focus on God. That's, that's why he got the name. So there's, there's a lot of turmoil all of a sudden thrown into this to make them rethink, what does this parable mean? What does this look like? And then you start having to ask the question of yourself, am I covetous? Was I just a second ago going, man, this guy's got it all together, and realized inside myself, I'm the one that's off base. The, the question that, that I, I wrote down uh, within this is, am I rich towards God? That, that's the, the last verses that, that he says here. What, what if, I, if I'm rich or I'm not rich, it's the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. So now all of a sudden it's like, okay, well, how am, I, how am I handling my finances? How am I handling my time? Am I being generous to other people? Am I being compassionate to other people? Those things come up into play. Uh, when I was going through uh, the, the book I was talking about last week, the, the Challenge of Jesus' Parables, which is one of the resources I'm going through, I told you it's like uh, different commentaries from different people written, written about into it. Um, and last week it was a young lady, I think her name was Ellen something. This, this week it's a guy by the name of Stephen Wright. And how many, does anybody remember Stephen Wright, the comedian from the 90s? Yeah. Am I the only one who, Deb, thank you, I love you. Anybody else? Katie? Well, we're running the generations. Okay, sweet. Stephen Wright, if you ever get bored, check him out on YouTube, because uh, I'm going to really hack uh, him, because uh, I don't have his presentation, I don't have his uh, demeanor, but he's like very solemn, very dry pan, and he just makes these really stupid observations. Um, I'm talking about some of the, the, the ones. Uh, I remember him uh, saying, I have a, uh, the world's largest collection of seashells that I keep scattered across the beaches across the world. <laughs> I mean, just really dumb stuff like that. Or if, you, if your house is in a, uh, on a median and a highway, do you have to leave your driveway at 55 miles an hour? <laughs> if you're driving at the speed of light and you're showing your headlights, do they do anything? It's just these. So it was really kind of odd to me to see that Stephen Wright, I'm sure it's not the same guy writing commentary, but nonetheless, he wrote this. He says, the rich will find out soon enough that they don't control even their own lives. Don't be fooled into aspiring to be like them. And again, remember, for most of us in this room, most anybody that's going to be watching anything on this podcast, uh, you might have financial struggles, but compared to the world, you're rich. Most of us. There's a, a couple that struggle to find food. There's a couple that, that, that we work with on their housing. That's different. But for most of us, if you have a house, you have a food, you're rich. What do you do with that? Not just by action, but in your heart. This is what Jesus is trying to get through to this particular crowd of people who don't have much money to work with at all. The second one, as he builds on these, is one I'm not going to go through with you, but I will give you the reference. Uh, Chris, if we'll go to Luke 16. The bond there, 1 through 13. I'm going to give this one to you as homework. I told you we wouldn't, wouldn't go through all of them, but it is a good one to dig into. And it will give you a good opportunity to use this tool at home uh, on your own. So here, here's what I'm, I'm asking you to do, what I'm encouraging you to do, whatever pastor is supposed to be saying about that, because I know I'm not allowed to demand it, but maybe I can. I've seen some religious uh, leaders in the Bible who are supposed to command according to the will of God. But go through this particular section. It's the parable of the dishonest uh, manager. It, the, the context is not a crowd. It's the disciples. It's someone that he is changing their gear from being people who struggle with money to having a godly aspect when it came to their finances and what their heart should be towards their finances. And, again, apply this study tool to it. It will apply. Um, and if you go through it and you do it well... I can almost guarantee there's one voice that would take and knock you off your feet a little bit, and you'd be like, that doesn't sound right. There's one voice in there that, that does not sound right of quick passing. And so instead of just texting me and saying, Tom, what's this voice mean? Uh, study a little bit. Think about it a little bit. Pray over it a little bit. Uh, if you have a, a commentary, too, you can go to BibleGateway.com. There's Matthew Henry's commentary there. Do a little study on it, and then send me a text or a message and say, hey, this is some of the things I got out of the parable. This is what I think about this first. And I'd love to have that conversation, but I'd love to see you kind of dig into it first. So that one has a lot of good stuff in it. But we're going to keep going. To There's still 16, but we're going to go to verse 19. In verse 19, we have the rich man and Lazarus. 
Uh, and like I said, this is the one that the system doesn't fully work with. Uh, and then I'll explain why I think that's the case. So in this case, we see that Jesus is with Pharisees. We see that up in verse 14. 14 tells us a little bit of something that we need to know when it comes to this particular parable. It says the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all of these things, and they ridiculed him. So we know that the Pharisees are not on board with Jesus on this, and we know that they have more than enough finances as religious leaders of the time. And so he's dealing with them, and he says this in verse 19. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted uh, very well every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with souls, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. So again, sadly, this is a familiar scene. Um, I did notice that some had put out there that maybe, and this would be very possible at the time, the rich man's clothes in purple and fine linen. Lazarus is naked. That's what some believe. That's all he had was to cover his sores. Maybe he was, maybe he wasn't, I don't know. But it's a common scene for the Pharisees to have beggars outside their door, and it's a common scene for the Pharisees to have nothing to do with them. Uh, it seems incomprehensible, uh, but it's very common still in the world today. If you want to uh, read a book, for those of you who like to read books, um, there's a book that some of us, uh, Scott, it's a good thing. It's a good thing if you read a book. Yeah, no, it's a good thing. He's a book reader. I always make a reference because I don't want to like re take and say, here's a great book to, when I hardly read. I'm like the worst person. But I did read this book, uh, Under the Overpass. If you've been around for a while, you might have heard of that one. Under the Overpass is a, a great book. It's two uh, Christian men who decided to be homeless for six months, uh, one month in six uh, different major cities, uh, and share their experiences, including their experiences with the church. Uh, and there's good things in that, and there's sad things within that, uh, because these things still happen. I, I remember when we went to get Emily in Kazakhstan uh, yesterday, no, today, 16 years since we got custody of Emily. Yay! Yay. And Ryan, my son is 31 today, so we're doubly blessed today. Um, and neither one of them are here, so <laughs> forget them. Uh, no, the, um, but when we were over in Kazakhstan, we were, uh, and I've shared this before, we were oddities, Jenny and I were, because we were uh, a pastor and a pastor's wife, and uh, we don't look like anything that they know is to be true. In Kazakhstan, uh, there's only 8% of the nation is anything religious outside of Muslim or Russian Orthodox. Those are the two primaries by far. And uh, so we were very interested to kind of explore the, temp the, 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 the Russian Orthodox churches. We were, to be able to, to, to see worship at the time. Uh, our translator and our driver were very interested uh, in us because we don't look like a uh, priest that you're not allowed to speak to or walk around doing homilies. Uh, they, they, they got us, and that's odd. And uh, so they had a bunch of questions and type things. And it was really cool because our translator became a Christian well, about a month after we left, so I don't know if that had anything to do with us or not. But anyways, uh, it was so extreme different for them that uh, my favorite story to share with that is one time we had them over to our apartment and um, we were showing them uh, pictures from our church and playing with them sound files of our worship team at the time. And um, they, again, our, and our worship team's more, more modern and uh, there came up a picture of a couple of guys at our church staying there drinking coffee, talking to each other, again, we're casual dressed. And they've never, never seen anything like this before. And um, our driver, he could not speak uh, hardly any English at all. His name was Misha. And Misha, we love Misha. Misha was a raging alcoholic. Um, he had, to the point that, and the, but this was so common in the country, instead of windshield wiping fluid in his car, he had vodka. So, because it was cheaper and it cleaned the windows, and if he wanted to drink, <laughs> honest to God. Okay, and clubs every night, great guy, really good guy. But we, yeah, we talked and prayed. But, uh, He's sitting there looking at, like, listening to the sound files, and he's looking at the picture. These two guys stand there, and he looks at me, and he's looking down at it, and looks at me, he looks down. Finally goes, beer? I'm like, no, it's not, that's not a bar. <laughs> that's our church. <laughs> you know, whatever. So there's a lot of differences. But one thing that we saw here that really resembled is when we went to the, uh, the temple when um, 
services were going on, there was a line of bakers. I mean, pretty much everywhere you went, there was bakers. But when services were going on, there, there would easily be 20, 30 bakers along the, the sidewalk going in, and no one paid attention to them. No one paid attention to them. Now, we had gotten some warnings from our translator of why not to do begging, uh, not to get the beggars when they're within walking distance of your home, if they could follow you home or whatnot, uh, which we somewhat adhered to, somewhat didn't. Uh, we got really good at giving money to beggars without her seeing us. Uh, but we, we, we helped along with the, the, the church folks because it's just, that's what the church is supposed to do. But we got in trouble for it with our, our translator. Um, that's just the mindset. That's the mindset. And I, and I think it kind of resembles what we see here of what they're used to is just ignoring the beggars. You don't know what you're going to get into. You don't know there's going to be struggles. And then you just got your own selfishness within it as well. So it's very familiar to them. But then Jesus moves into the unfamiliar. He says, the poor man, verse 22, died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being a torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham fall off at Lazarus, and at Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger into water and cool my tongue, for I'm in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm that has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may be able to cross from there to us. That's a drastic change, because they're now going to the unfamiliar to the point of going into the spirit world. Um, we could spend quite a bit of study just on what is Abraham's bosom, uh, what is Hades, how does that compare to hell, how does that compare to heaven, how do these things come into play. I'm not going to get into all of that. I can't say that I think I will ever fully understand all of that, um, more than a, a good casual understanding until we get home. It's the spirit realm. It's, it's uh, what, what's tomorrow? or maybe later today, depending on how my car ride home goes. I mean, it's, just, it's, it's the spirit realm. Um, generally, in the Old Testament, before Jesus fulfilled, uh, Abraham's bosom was a place of comfort for those that followed God, that were waiting to hear the gospel message and be honored into heaven. Hades, uh, there's actually some different theological thoughts on exactly how hell plays out, Hades plays out, the end of, judgment, end of day's judgment plays out. Trust me, hell's will heaven's will, but how these things play out was not necessarily his main focus into this time when he's talking to these other theological men. He was talking about this incredible uh, truth, an incredible truth about how today's decisions impact tomorrow. And for them to be identifying with the rich man and understanding how he doesn't want to think to the beggar right now is completely flipped upside down on its head. And now they have quite a bit to think about. Um, when we get to verse 27, we'll finish up this particular uh, tale. It says, He said, this being the rich man, I beg you, Father, to send him, Lazarus, to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses, they have the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to them, If they do not hear Moses, and they do not hear the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone, someone should rise from the dead. We do not necessarily have a back to familiar, per se. We do have some unexpected, but it does deviate a little bit. My theory on this, and again, what you have in the scripture you're stuck with, what Tom believes is what you can consider and throw away or keep, whatever. The Bible is what you've got to really embrace. Uh, I don't think this is a parable. I think that's why it doesn't match up in the same way. Uh, two reasons. Well, I'll just stick with the main. The main one being this. And no other parable is there ever a character named. No other parable. It doesn't match up to, to this particular story, but mostly because Lazarus is named. And if you look at it from that standpoint, I think it's very easily seen that he's not making up something to put side by side. He's telling a story that he's aware about. There was a rich man, and there was a beggar, 
And he was somebody. His name was Lazarus. And he struggled hard. And the rich man ignored him. I don't, I don't think this was a made-up tale. I know when he was in his bosom. I know his response in Hades. I believe this very much is a true story that Jesus is sharing with, with them. Now it's too late for the rich man, but it wasn't for the Pharisees and it isn't for us. So the question I believe that is being asked here, the one I noted down, was simply this. What are you doing today that impacts the reality of eternity? What are you doing today that impacts the reality of eternity? Think about the things that the rich man did. Whether or not you're rich, think about what he did. He ignored Lazarus. So he's lacking in compassion towards people around him that had needs. He lavished life, which means he was self-focused. Everything he did with his time and his finances had to do with himself. His comfort, his needs, his desires, his personal goals. That's the reason why I talk about, be kind of cautious about goal stress. Goal stress is not real stress. If you don't have food and you don't have a house and you're stressed out, okay, let's take it to God and let's work on it together. But if I'm not putting as much in my 401k this year as I thought I would, that's called goal stress. You know, we've we got to kind of watch where we're, we're putting our anxiety and these things that come into place uh, because Jesus is really preaching against it. Actually, if you even look after the, uh, the first people we went through, he immediately goes into, don't be anxious about anything in your life. That to make sure that we have everything in the right focus instead of self-focus. Uh, he ignored all the warnings. He is a Jewish man, enough that he knows that Father Abraham is Father Abraham and calls him Father. So he ignored all the warnings of the prophets all the warnings of Moses, and if we're ignoring what we know is true in the Word and saying, well, yeah, that's true, I heard that, and I I read this or whatever, but I'm glad Jesus is patient because right now I just really want to save up for this vacation instead of help somebody. Uh, that's, That's something we really have to watch because we know the truth and we're not living by the truth. And what you and I have that he did not have is someone did die and come back from the dead to be able to give us the gift of grace if we accept Jesus as leader and forgive in our lives. Um, he also didn't care about reaching out to others. He thought he was fine and probably had him all kinds of parties with his brother and never once brought, brought up, hey, do you think we're doing the right thing here? What do you think eternity looks like? What do we have here? He, he made a lot of decisions that affected his tomorrow and now he's paying dearly for it and that's not God's will. God doesn't want us to have to go through that. So, the question becomes, if we're going to go with just these two parables today, is where do you find yourself in the rich man? Uh, where do you find yourself in the stories that are there? Um, none of us want to think, oh, I'm just ignoring people on the side of the road. Do we ignore people on the side of the road? There's just a lot of things to think about, about a heart of money. It really doesn't have, matter how much money we have, but a heart of money. What our goals are. What does rich really look like? And what does poverty really look like? If you find yourself like thinking in any spectrum of this, like, okay, yeah, I've got some room to move, or holy cow, I've really been on the wrong track. Here's the most encouraging thing in all this. When the rich man, even from Hades, said, Father, what did Abraham say back? Son. Son. Whatever choices we have, whatever we're struggling today, it's just a matter of God sitting there saying, son, daughter, let's, let's move forward from here.